good morning, good afternoon, maybe maybe good evening. Um, I'm not sure what time you're watching this, but I'm really thankful that you've taken the time to join me for this seminar um, in the series dealing with the Book of Nature. Now, this particular um, talk, I was really impressed to shift gears a little bit. Uh, it's really about life, but it's more about newness of life in Christ. Um, there won't be quite as much, um, how do we say, um, biological science talk in here, but I really believe uh, strongly that this is a message that God has impressed on my heart to share with you all uh, for such a time as we're living. And so I, I want to I wanna share that with you. The topic is life sciences, why the greatest barrier to our end time witness is an attack on the resurrection of Jesus Christ in our lives. So with that, um, let's have a word of prayer and then we will dive in. Father in heaven, I'm just so thankful that you have given us um, through the death and resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ, you've given us access to power that's far beyond what we could ever imagine. Um, Lord, I know that you have promised each and every one of us um, through your covenant that you're very, very faithful with, that you will rescue us, that you, you want us more than anything. And I just pray that as we go through this message, Lord, that you would press on our hearts how the best place we can be is under your authority. We're thankful that you've given us the opportunity to be here. Lord, hide me behind your cross, Lord. I know that I am definitely not worthy to, to share this message, and I just pray that you would help um, the message come through clear despite the, the flaws of the messenger. Help me to uh, just also be blessed myself um, through this time. And I pray that you would just speak to each person and myself included. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, um, the premise I want to start with is a quote from Testimonies to Ministers. Um, it's an interesting quote um, that's, I think, going to give us a nice little pivot point to, to begin with. It says, there is need for a much closer study of the Word of God, especially should Daniel and Revelation have attention as never before in the history of our work. We may have less to say in some lines in regard to the Roman power and the papacy. Hmm, we've been saying a lot of, about them lately. But we should call attention to what the prophets and the apostles have written under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit has has so shaped matters, both in the giving of prophecy and in the events portrayed, as to teach that the human agent is to be kept out of sight, hid in Christ, and the Lord God of heaven and his law are to be exalted. So God and his law need exaltation. So what I want to share with you today is something that kind of jumped out at me from got a mosquito here we're going to eradicate jumped out at me from um, just doing a little bit of study on my own um, and also really I think one of the biggest blessings is when you sit down and study with someone else um, and you and you ask God to guide and ask the Holy Spirit to lead um, different things can just pop in and and I really noticed this as if as I was thinking about how um, some of the I would say more peculiar doctrines that we as a church have, um, sometimes we we don't feel as comfortable sharing those, right? Sometimes we're like, well, what is what is it about, you know, the Sunday law? Why is that? What's so, what does that mean, really? What, what is that? Uh, Mark of the Beast, how do we get, you know, and we know uh, in ourselves as Adventists, we understand the value and the importance of that. But a lot of times we're, more, um, how do we say, slow to share these messages because we don't necessarily understand in greater depth the bigger significance of them. 
And so this really, um, just unpacking what I studied here, really helped me kind of see better, I would say, um, the significance of the Sunday Law in its, in its broader scope. Um, so what I want to do um, before we really dive into that is take a look at how um, salvation for each one of us works, right? Uh, I think probably uh, there wouldn't be a better place to go than into the writings of Paul, uh, maybe looking at uh, Romans chapter 6, uh, just to see kind of what is it um, that he says about the way um, salvation works for each one of us. Foundationally, right? The very basics of it. So um, looking at Romans chapter 6, I'll dive in there right away. And there's so many places that Paul, you know, he's kind of more like lawyer speak, right? He just, he can get, he can get quite, uh, I would say, interesting to read. Um, but, uh, and maybe a little bit heavy to read. Um, sometimes confusing to read, maybe. Um, but certainly he, he has written things multiple times just to make it really clear that, okay, these particular areas, you really ought to be able to have clear in your mind. So starting in Romans chapter uh, 6 and verse 1, it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now you might be saying, why am I reading all this stuff? I've heard this so many times. What is the point of this? Well, two key points importance of death in Christ, as he died, we died. And second point, as he resurrected, we ought to, in newness of life. So to be in newness of life here, is this speaking about the resurrection to come? And yes, in a sense, but it's not just speaking about that. It's speaking about baptism here. When we get baptized into his death, we come up in newness of life. So there's this idea that when we come up, there's something about that newness of life that is analogous to or is encompassed by or is symbolized by, but not just symbolized, is quite literally empowered by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this key issue, I, I hope and I pray and I'm sure that most of you would agree that the resurrection of Jesus Christ and its effect in our life is absolutely pivotal, critical, is, it is the one key thing that allows us to have hope. In fact, if we jump to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'm not going to read um, everything there, but there's some interesting statements here. This, this chapter is actually often used, um, uh, misquoted to, to talk about the baptism for the dead, um, which... Uh, or uh, which is uh, a teaching in the, in the Mormon Church, and it's it's actually quite easy to unpack this uh, if you read the whole chapter in context, because then you can see that it's talking about the resurrection of Christ, and that there would be no purpose for any one of us to be baptized if Christ was not res resurrected. Why? Because if we, we were baptized in that way, that to be baptized for the dead, if we were baptized in that way, we might as well just stay underwater, right? There's, there, there'd be no resurrection. So um, just I'll just share one verse here that uh, makes it pretty clear. 
um, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse uh, 16, for example, it says, For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, ye are yet in your sins. So ultimately, there's really not a purpose. Um, if Christ wasn't resurrected, we would not have hope for the future. We would not have hope for the future. So uh, now I want to take a minute and dive into the great controversy theme. Because we're, we're admonished, and I'm going to share this one quote with you, to kind of consider things, the grand themes. Um, education page 190 says, The student should learn to view the word, the Bible, as a whole, and to see the relation of its parts. He should gain a knowledge of its grand central theme, of God's original purpose for the world, of the rise of the great controversy, and of the work of redemption, work of redemption key. He should understand the nature of the two principles that are contending for supremacy, and should learn to trace their working through the records of history and prophecy to the great consummation. He should see how this controversy enters into every phase of human experience. Now, many of you watching, maybe you're in different phases of your human experience. So you need to think about how, do, how might this apply to your particular phase of the human experience. How in every act of life, he himself reveals the one or the other of the two antagonistic motives. So either side of the great controversy, right? And how, whether he will or not, he is even now deciding upon which side of the controversy he will be found. So that's education page 190. So at this moment, we all, each of us, are making those decisions on a daily basis, on a moment by moment basis, as to which side of the great controversy we, we lie on. Um, and so what I want to do is think about, as we just read um, in, in Paul's writings, that it's critical that Christ died, but it's at least as critical, or even more, but both are critical, that he's resurrected. Those are two aspects. Now, now those two aspects in Christ's life, also we find in our life, it's critical that we die to self, and it's critical that we raise up to newness of life as Christ was resurrected, right? So, um, in order for the devil to try to stop us, he would need to make us fail in that death part or make us fail in that resurrection part, right? Makes sense? Pretty straightforward, right? So, um, so what are some things that we um, can do or we can, what choices can we make to ensure that we have both that correct death in Christ and the correct resurrection in Christ or the proper resurrection in Christ? Well, um, remember the beauty of the gospel. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So is there something we can do to earn this death part? No, absolutely not. Um, dying to Christ or dying to ourselves, dying with Christ, dying, being crucified with Christ. He's kind of actually done that without our permission. <laughs> He's gone out of his way and said, well, you know what? I'm going to die for you. And our huge work here sounds pretty tough is to accept that, right? Is to accept that, to recognize by faith that yes, he indeed has done that for us. So while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Um, and, you know, but the, but the harder part, there is a hard part, and that is to really die, <laughs> right? We have a hard time where it's easy for us to say, okay, wow, Christ died for me. That's so wonderful, as long as I get to still be myself, right? <laughs> right? Well, Christ died for us, and you know what? He promises to, to take that heart. Remember, we talked about the heart last session. He promises to take that dirty, filthy, stony heart and transform that into a new one, and he will do that. However, the one condition is we need to have the willingness to give it up to him. We have to be willing to be willing or willing to be made willing to let go of our, our selfish motives, the authority we have over our own lives, and allow God to have that supremacy. And this takes different steps. You, you've probably read through this in, in, in Steps to Christ. It's such a beautiful book. Um, 
If you believe, God, believe God's promises, you act in belief. You give yourself to him daily. But ultimately, um, those, those parts, you can just read them from the chapters in, in the... In, in, if you went to the beginning of Steps to Christ, you know, you can look at the chapter and say, oh, God's love for man, the sinner's need of Christ, repentance, confession, consecration. These first one, two, three, four chapters, these are dealing with that part of recognizing God's love because it's God's love that draws us to repentance, right? And then recognizing, okay, we need him. We need him more than anything. And then seeing, wait a minute, as I come closer to Christ, I see the flaws in myself. I need to repent. And, and we confess um, those sins and then we, we, and we acknowledge them, right? That they're real. And then we can start to, to turn, turn our lives around and say, you know what, Lord? I want you to take control because you can see the way I mess myself up, right? And so these are the important stages, right? I'm not going to dig too much deeper in that because I, I, I really want to jump into more about the, the meat of what we're talking about tonight. And that is, how does this all tie in? So, key thing that I want to bring out here is, remember how uh, resurrection is important. Jesus' resurrection. So, in a real sense, we need Christ. We, ha we absolutely need his resurrection, right? We need Christ's resurrection in order for us to have hope of life, hope of our newness of life. Um, interesting point. His actual resurrection did happen. We know that. But not without some resistance, right? Do you remember that? Let's take a look. Let's take a look in um, Matthew, book of Matthew. And this is where I want, to, I want us to carefully consider. Um, because sometimes I don't think, at least I was never taught this, and maybe... This is something that um, hopefully I won't be called a heretic for, but I really believe that this um, helps solidify for me the reason why certain things are coming in, down the pipeline prophetically very soon. So let's take a look here. Um, after Jesus died, right? You know, he, he died, he was buried in the, in the tomb of... Um, the Joseph's tomb. And as he was in that tomb, um, sepulcher, if you want to call it, notice that there was an interesting thing that took place. Uh, there were a number of, I would say, uh, religious powers, right? There was a, uh, the, the, the Jews of the time that were in power, um, the chief priests and the Pharisees, they came to, together. It says in Matthew ch chapter 27, verse 62. Now the next day that followed the day of preparation, uh, the chief priests, now which day would that have been? Sabbath. Interesting that they went on Sabbath to talk. Anyhow, on Sabbath, the chief priests and the Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that, that deceiver said while he was yet alive, After three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulchre be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say unto him, He is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch. Go your way. Make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulchre sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. Hmm. Sealing the stone. Sealing the stone sealing the stone and setting a watch. Pay careful attention to that. So Pilate, in collaboration, even though he was kind of coerced into it, he didn't really himself want to do this, did he? No. It was the Jewish powers that came and they said, listen, you know what? We want to make sure that there's no further deception coming from this. So let's seal him in the tomb. Let's seal Jesus in the tomb. Now, we know that didn't work out, work out so well, right? Um, but I want you to think about what was going on here. 
Notice something very simple about this. Jesus died on Friday. Jesus rested in the tomb on Sabbath, according to the commandment. And Jesus rose again on which day? Sunday, right? I know your wheels are turning. I hope so. When have you heard of something that sounds like uh, an alliance between a religious and a political power that tries to seal or tries to impose a mark forcing Sunday rest? Forcing Sunday rest? Really? Forcing Sunday rest? Where could that have come from? Wow. Indeed. This, I believe, was the first Sunday law. If you take a look at the motivation of Jesus, not the motivation, uh, the motivation of Jesus clearly was to come again, come up and come again, right? He was gonna, he was gonna be resurrected, he was gonna go um, and do his thing, um, and we uh, are the beneficiaries of that. On the other hand, there's another power. Remember, we're told to look at the great themes. We're told to look at this controversy. What's going on on either side of this controversy? Well, it turns out, let's take a look. At, there's, a, there's a great section in, great, in, um, in uh, the Desire of Ages um, talking about this. Um, and it's interesting because when Jesus died and was in the tomb, the devil kind of thought that maybe he was victorious. He was like, man... You know what? He's dead now. Yes. In fact, he had been inciting the crowd to crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. So, uh, listen to this statement. When Jesus was laid in the grave, Satan triumphed. He did. He dared. This is uh, um, page 784 um, of Desire of Ages. When Jesus was laid in the grave, Satan triumphed. He dared to hope that the Savior would not take up his life again. He claimed the Lord's body and set his guard about the tomb, seeking to hold Christ a prisoner. He was bitterly angry when his angels fled at the approach of the heavenly messenger. When he saw Christ come forth in triumph, listen to this, he knew, this was when it sealed it, he knew that his kingdom would have an end and that he must finally die. So this event was not of minor importance in the great controversy, right? We know this. I mean, we, we all understand this. But looking at this now, you know, we think, we say, wow, how silly that those powers tried to close, hold that tomb. You know, it wasn't just um, religio and political powers trying to hold that seal. All the powers, all the evil angels possible were rallied there to try and hold that tomb closed. But you know, uh, it's interesting um, that there was really nothing, there was no way that um, uh, this could have been prevented. Um, she says in another place on page 781, mountains piled upon mountains over his sepulcher could not have prevented him from coming forth. So um, was Christ going to uh, be taking on the false um, system or the false sign or the false seal? Was, was that seal something that he was, he was okay with? No, he, he didn't allow that um, to take place. However, it gives you an eye into the motives of the devil going forward. Because now, remember, Jesus goes to heaven and woe, woe, woe to what? The inhabitants of the earth, for the devil has, is coming with great wrath because he knows he has a little time. He knows he has only a little time, right? He knows he's going to die. It says it here. It's clear that he is going to die. So he wants to try to get as many of us flipping sides. So now, since we know that Jesus kept the Sabbath, right? And we know the Sabbath is a sign. Jesus kept the Sabbath 
in the tomb. And the Sabbath is something very special, right? And this is something I don't need to preach to you too much about, but I, I we want to review this. So the Sabbath is a sign that what? What is the Sabbath a sign of? I, the Lord, sanctify you. Ezekiel 20, verse 12. Um, it's... It's not just, let's take a look at that chapter because there's another verse in there, right? Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 12 says, Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they may know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. Um, and interestingly, if you go to verse 20, it says, And hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and thou, that they may know, or that ye may know, that I am, what? The Lord your God. So, we are signifying our allegiance to God through keeping the Sabbath. We are signifying our submission to his authority through the Sabbath. Now, I want you to think carefully about that because a lot of times we say, okay, the Sabbath is something that I keep um, because, you know, it's it's the sign, right? Like it says here, it's a sign. And I need to keep the Sabbath. And and there's the, the mark of the beast. And if I don't keep Sabbath, then I'm, if I'm keeping Sunday, I'm going to have the mark of the beast. I can't have the mark of the beast because then... But wait a minute now. The most important thing about the sign is that we're actually giving into the authority of God, that we are submitting to his authority, that we have submitted to him and we're letting him live. Because remember that death part, right? Uh, that we talked about earlier. You need to die to self first. Then you can be resurrected in newness of life. So the Sabbath is a sign that we give up and that God sanctifies us, right? That we give up on ourselves in this regard and we say, look, Lord, you take the reins you can do the sanctification part. So another great, um, uh, uh, from the great controversy, uh, we know that the Sabbath will be a great test of loyalty. Um, it's this key thing about serving God. So let's take a look at this. When the final test shall be brought to bear upon men, then the line of distinction will be drawn between those who serve God and those who serve him not. While the observation of the false Sabbath in compliance with the law of, of the state, contrary to the fourth commandment, will be an avowal of allegiance to a power that is in opposition to God, the keeping of the true Sabbath in obedience to God's law is an evidence of loyalty to the Creator. While one class, by accepting the sign of submission to earthly powers, receive the mark of the beast, the other, choosing the token of allegiance to divine authority, receive the seal of God. So it's a token of allegiance. It's not the entire allegiance, right? It's the token of allegiance. So key point here is that we are through the Sabbath. The Sabbath is kind of a memorial of the fact that we've been created by God. It's also a memorial that he can recreate us. And that is a sign of us accepting uh, that we want to be loyal to God, right? Our loyalty is number one to God. Now, what do you suppose the Sunday law then is? Well, I believe it's not just, okay, we know, of course, that it's the mark of the beast. It's there, the counterfeit sign of authority. But it's also a sign, quite oppositely, that I, that the Lord cannot sanctify you, right? It's a sign that the Lord can, why? Because you've taken, you've taken, you've outwardly taken another source of authority and you've 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 taught you've sort of like kind of like the tree of knowledge and evil uh, of good and evil you've said okay well i'm gonna i'm gonna push aside god's authority and i'm gonna do my own thing that's that's essentially what what the what the sunday law um constitutes um however uh i would posit to you as we as we're considering this that uh when we look at scripture and I just and I brought this out already, but I want to nail this point home. When we look at scripture, remember, there are so many places where certain stories in scripture, they have additional meaning. So they have greater meaning. And I believe the resurrection of Jesus is one of those as well. 
Um, so when we look, uh, and this is where I, I think we need to we need to focus our attention, because I think our, even though we have a good understanding of the Sunday law, we have a good understanding of of the sign of God, the seal of God. Um, we I think sometimes our perspective could use tweaking. I think we could we could have a better comprehension of the real deeper meaning of this if we really understood what is it what are the motives behind this um so for example when we talked about romans chapter 5 and actually romans chapter 5 and 6 both 5 and 6 um and basically these chapters as i mentioned in, in uh, romans chapter 6 but if you look in romans chapter 5 as well these are essentially pretty straightforward verses and chapters on what aspect of Adventism that's really prominent? You might be saying it right now, I wish I could hear you. Um, this concept of righteousness by faith, right? Righteousness by faith. That in believing, we can have the righteousness of Christ. Um, that we, we have these different parts. Of course, there's many other chapters in Romans that talk about that. But certainly the idea that we uh, are dying to self and that Christ is arisen in us and that he um, is what get, he is the one who uh, provides us with that newness of life, and that there's nothing that we can earn uh, of ourselves. It's righteousness by faith alone. Um, you know, Paul talks about it extensively elsewhere as well. So um, clearly, this is righteousness by faith. Now, many of you might recall this statement made in the Spirit of Prophecy, um, where it's actually in Evangelism, page one ninety. It says. Justification by faith is what? Is the third angel's message in verity, right? You've heard this before. And I know that we as Adventists have, have often struggled with that. Um, I myself too have been like, well, what does she mean by that? How can a, a wording message, don't take the mark, be so closely and intimately tied to justification by faith how does that how does that even how do those even fit well could it be that the story of the resurrection has end time implications and that that end time implication connection is how we can understand better justification by faith and its link to this mark. So let's take a look. So the mark of the beast is both an attack on the law of God, specifically, and, okay, it's an attack on the law of God specifically, we know that. But it's not just an attack on the law of God per se. It's really a specific attack. Remember the controversy? The great controversy is really about every individual soul. It's about your soul. It's about your heart. It's a battle. The greatest battle is the battle for your heart. That is where we need to focus. An attack, the mark of the beast, is actually primarily an attack on the life of Christ being lived out in us. That's the main attack. How do we know that? Because the first Sunday law was trying to keep Jesus in the tomb. And I believe that even the second Sunday law, the manifestation, the, 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 the Sunday law to come, if you will, there's probably been multiple Sunday laws, you guys can all cite them. There's many, many different um, you know, iterations of the Sunday law, if you will, that have even some have happened, some are happening and so forth. But the point I'm making is that um, the key issue that the devil is trying to um, you know skirt and not let us focus on is that he wants to prevent Christ's life from being lived in us and he wants to do that by holding that tomb shut our stony hearts to remain closed and not let Jesus burst out of there and be that life of us be that life in us I should say so um, we looked at the story of the resurrection. We know that Jesus certainly didn't, uh, uh, that seal didn't hold him in. Let's put it that way. Um, so 
the nice thing about Jesus' resurrection is it confirms this wonderful thing. Um, it's really a type, a metaphor. It's, it's, it's a representation of how we also should walk in newness of life. But it's really more than that. It's, it's actually his life that lives in us. So this is, it's, it really is his life. So when we talk about justification by faith, that is, the essence of that is, is what? What's another way we've talked about this? As, as Adventists, we talk about this. Christ, our what? Christ, our righteousness, right? We see Christ, our righteousness as the theme of justification by faith. That we, it's not our righteousness. We need Christ's righteousness. Well, uh, let me tell you, the devil is trying to hold that righteousness back. And if you, if you haven't noticed it, I've noticed it in our churches, in my own life, how many times are we, we focused on, okay, well, you know, what about sin? Um, you know, can we really conquer sin? Um, is it possible that, oh, what was the nature of Christ? There's all these debates that have come into the church, and many of them have made us think, wait a minute, am I really uh, able to overcome? Is it possible? Well, wait a minute, yeah, I'm, well, you're right, you're not able to overcome. But Christ can make us more than conquerors, right? Because we can be more than conquerors through who? Christ, who gives us strength. So, um, is this is this resurrection of Christ, is that, is this starting to sound a little bit more like justification by faith? I think so. Now, I'll tell you, um, frustrating the devil is one of the things, the best things we can do, isn't it? Because he wants to frustrate us. So let me tell you, we ought to be here trying to frustrate him. Now, could it be that all the devil is really trying to do is trying to redo what he tried to do to hold Jesus in the tomb? He tried to, he tried to hold him dead there. And because he failed at that, now he's turned his attention to us. And he's trying to hold the meaning, the significance, the, the free gift that Christ has given us. He's trying to say, no, 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 you can't have that. That's not yours. You're not good enough. You're not, you're not, you're, you, God, God, no, God can't give you that. You've done this, this, there's just no way. Those are all the lies of the devil. And you hear those discouraging words when the devil is saying, you know what? Um, yeah, but you forgot that you did this. Yeah, but you're not, you, there's no way that you'll be able to do that. Um, what about this? You know what? That's when we have to turn to the devil and say, get thee behind me because Christ has given us this gift. It's already done. He came out of the tomb, right? His victory is our victory. We and, and this is this is the, this is a place where I wish I wish that I'd grasped this better myself earlier. Is that Christ's victory is our victory? We don't. We no longer need to be um, living in a state of of defeat because we're not. We are not defeated. We are the. The devil is defeated. Christ has defeated the devil. We just need to get on the right side. We just need to be willing, to be made willing to, to do God's will. And you know what? He will both will and do his good pleasure in our hearts, right? In our lives. So could it be, and this is what I'm going to pose at you, this is my challenge to you as we as we get through the last part of this, is, is it possible that by our focus on the Sunday law, we've lost sight of the most critical aspect of this end time message, which is submitting to Christ and giving him full authority to sanctify us, which is the sign, right? Remember the sign? Remember the reason we call the Sabbath a sign is because it has, what are the three main attributes that it has, right? It has the name of God, right? It has his, his uh, domain. It has his ownership. It has his what he's created, right? And it has his authority right? Those things are all captured in there. So a seal, like the seal of a king, has all those things in it. Now, key part of this, I really, I think uh, that's coming to me from this, um, from understanding this, is submission to authority, submission to Christ's authority. When we take the sign of the Sabbath as our, as the sign that we will, we will cling to, that sign it's not just like, okay, I'm going to keep Sabbath right. Thank you. You know, God, I'm going to do everything 
um, you need me to do about the Sabbath. And every week I'll be here at a church and, you know, I definitely won't take the mark because I know the Sunday law is coming and I'm not going to let that happen. Um, in me, at least I'll, I'll definitely be going to church on Saturdays, you know, and, and, or is it, wait a minute, I give you authority over my entire life. I'm giving you control. Which is it? We need to recognize it. The Sabbath is actually just a sign of that, of giving entire control to God. So, name, title, authority, that's what, that's what it contains. Um, but recognizing that authority part is huge and recognizing him as our creator. So seeing Christ as our Lord and Savior, not just Savior, but Lord as well. Lord meaning Lord of our life. The fact that he has the say in our life, right? So what is the devil trying to do to stop this? I'm telling you, he's anything in his power, right? He he rallied all the host of, of, of evil angels to the tomb. Um, and uh, we won't go through it now, but I, I, you know, I encourage you to read, if you go to Desire of Ages and you read that, what happened when the angel of the Lord came down, shining light, interesting how light came and just the other, those evil angels were afraid. They just left. And this was one angel, the one angel that took the place of Lucifer, right? Came down, the angel of the Lord came down and went to the tomb and, moved the stone as if it was nothing and said, you know, your father calls you, right? So Jesus, isn't that incredible? What, I, You know, but here's the thing. Think about that victory. Your father calls you. So interesting. That, I want you to own that victory because it's it was Christ's victory, but Christ did that victory for you. <laughs> this is, this is, this is the thing that this is what really kind of shook me up here is that Christ did that victory for you. So um, I want to I want to share with you um, that short section here. Yeah, okay. Um just because it's so beautifully, beautifully stated here. Um, uh, so that the the men who are watching the tomb, you know, there were all the soldiers, the brave soldiers, right? They're watching the tomb. Um, they're afraid of human power. Um, or they they really are never afraid of human power, right? They they, they could handle anything. Um, but the face they look upon now is not the face of mortal warrior. It is the face of the mightiest of the Lord's hosts. The messenger is he who fills the position from which Satan fell. It is he who on the hills of Bethlehem proclaimed Satan's birth. Um, <laughs> proclaimed Satan's birth, sorry. Proclaimed Christ's birth. That's quite an important thing. Distinction. Um, the earth trembles at his approach. The hosts of darkness flee. And as he rolls away the stone, heavens, heaven seems to come down to earth. The soldiers see him removing the stone as he would a pebble and hear him cry, Son of God, come forth, thy father calls thee. They see Jesus come forth from the grave and hear him proclaim over the rent sepulcher, I am the resurrection and the life. As he comes forth in majesty and glory, the angel hosts bow in adoration before the Redeemer and welcome him with songs of praise. Um, and there's an earthquake and there are and there's uh, lots of other things happening. But let me tell you, that victory that Jesus won right there for us is for us. It's ours. He came out, and here's the thing. Um, that life that he says, I am the resurrection and the life, it's it's for us. He, he's, he's earned that life for us. We need to own it. We need to make the victory of Christ ours. That's what I want to get across. Notice, interestingly, if you think about the first, second, and third angel's messages. First angel's message, what is it? Cried with a loud voice saying, what? Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who created. Right? So, this scene here with an angel coming, the big... Kfuffle. A little bit of 
fear involved, it seemed, right? Not to say that the fear that's being talked of there is the same, but there's an awe, there's a reverence for God that happens. It's time to fear God, right? Clear, clearly, it's time to it's time to recognize God is king. God is God has the authority to, to to take the authority of my life. Let him have it. Each of us ought to let him have it because he's won that victory. And the victory is for is on our behalf. So on the flip side, what's happening is we've got this warning, right? In Revelation chapter 14. You all know that know it by heart probably so i don't need to read it but let's look at it anyway just to remind ourselves revelation chapter 14 um and looking and the third angel followed him saying with a loud voice if any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark on his forehead or in his hand the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of god which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels in the presence of the lamb now the warning is don't take this mark but the opposite, what is, what is, what is, what is the sign? Don't be, don't let the devil hold Christ in the tomb of your heart. Don't let his temptations keep you from giving in to the power of Christ to come into your life and transform it. Because that is Christ our righteousness. Don't let the devil prevent the resurrection of Christ in you. You know, um, in the Review and Herald um, in 1889, um, uh, this statement was made, page 546 uh, or page 545, um, uh, volume 66. It said, uh, you, we all know this, right? One interest will prevail. One subject will swallow up every other. What is that subject? Christ, our righteousness. We need to let go and let God, right? And this is the important thing about the Sunday law that we're sometimes getting distracted. We're trying to compartmentalize things. Remember, we're supposed to look as we were admonished through through the eyes, through with our 2020 vision, right? With clarity, with prophetic vision, Ellen White saw that we need to take scripture and we need to put this together so that we can see with clarity how all these pieces fit together. Jesus wants his life lived in us. He's willing to do it. He's already won us the victory. This fact is what we need to grasp. And we need not be afraid of it, even the Sunday law. Why? Because, you know, the Sabbath is that sign that we've consecrated our lives to Christ and that he is doing his will in us. He is doing his will in us. And this statement is going to blow your mind. I it, I did some, uh, I had to find this actually. I talked to my dad because I couldn't remember where this was from. And he had found it somewhere. And I, w I was just trying to figure this out. So this was a, was a letter that Ellen White wrote to Uriah Smith. Um, and it's Manuscripts Volume, Letters of Ma and Manuscripts Volume 13, uh, Letter 31. Um, in 1898, paragraph 22, she says, The sign of obedience is the observance of the Sabbath of the fourth commandment. The sign of obedience. Hmm. If men keep the fourth commandment, they will keep all the rest. Let me say that again. If men keep the fourth commandment, they will keep all the rest. Hold on a minute. So what you're saying is, if we properly keep the Sabbath holy, that is just symbolic of us giving in to the authority of God over our lives to keep everything. Wow. It was no human voice that spoke to Moses giving him the Sabbath as a sign. So it was God himself, right? The Lord spake to Moses saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Ye shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Every one that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. So, um, what I'm uh, wanting to appeal to you tonight, uh, today, this afternoon, whenever you're watching this message, the seal of God is really for those who fully submit to, the, to Christ's authority, who who 
follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth, who all we want is to just be followers of Christ. We want to give in. We want to claim his victory as ours. Because it is. He's given it to us. It's freely ours. And we need to submit to him. And, you know, we need to rest in Jesus. That's one thing. A lot of times, you know, we we get so anxious. And I, I'm, I'm pointing to myself here. We get anxious. We're like, well, what, what if I'm, I need to do this and do that? And, oh, am I, uh, uh, you know, we need to die to self so that Christ can actually live his life in us. And we need to let that resurrection power, um, the same resurrection power that could have blown through extra mountains um, that would have been piled on top to be what's resurrecting Christ in us and allow that to happen and not let the discouragements of the devil, the attempts of all of his evil angels to try to repress the resurrection of Christ in our hearts. Do not let those get in the way because his power is much greater than that. So, don't let Satan try to block him in by any influences. Um, you know, a lot of times I will say this is this is why I really think this is important. This message because it becomes personal. It becomes a heart issue. Your personal life, your personal heart. That's what the controversy is about. It yes, it's happening on a global scale. Yes, there will be. I'm not. I'm not saying there won't be an outward um, uh, mark mark of the beast. There will. That's going to be the enforcement of what. The devil is ultimately wanting to do, just like he would, wished he could have forced that tomb to be closed, he's going to try to force on everybody a false um, giving into his authority, while we, by God's grace, are going to stand firm, knowing that stand firm in the power that Christ gives us to stay on his side. And so... What I want to say, though, is let's look at this at a personal level. You know, we all, we're all we all looking at the news, and we're all saying there's this religious political power. They're all coming together. There's this church-state conspiracy that's taking place. What about the religious and political influences in your life? What about the uh, riches and the fame and the whatever it is, the influences of friends, the influences of the media, the influences of of whatever it is in your life, all of those influences that are uh, causing you to think not on spiritual things, causing you to turn your mind away from Christ, causing you to not submit to him every day because you're you're focusing on them. You're, the selfish desires, the lust of the flesh, the, the pride of life, lust of the eyes, those are the things that I'm, I'm speaking to myself here. Those are the things that each of us have as distractions. And those distractions are the ones that are actually allowing the devil to, to keep a little lid on the tomb, right? To cover, cover up, so don't let Jesus out. And this is really a problem personally for us. So ultimately, um, you know, we think of uh, religio-political influences as this issue, but the issue is we're allowing ourselves a lot of times because we're looking at the external, we're not recognizing that internal heart issue like we talked about in the last, in the last um, session. Um, so we need to consecrate ourselves to Christ every day. There's no other way. Um, you know, take make, make it our very first work in the morning, right? As it says in Steps to Christ, right? Um, you know, uh, and and tell him to live his life out in us. You know, ask for the resurrected Christ in our hearts and, and pray. And, you know, God will answer those prayers. I really truly believe he's going to come into your life. He's going to transform it. And it'll be the best thing ever. And this can happen in each of us. And you know what? What's beautiful about this? Let me tell you the witness of those men who were at the tomb. When they saw that light, when they saw that happen, when they saw that supernatural change that occurred, nothing could shut their mouths. And these were not even uh, religious people, right? They, they went and told people even before... They were told to be quiet. They had they'd already told lots of people. So I'm telling you, your witness, your end time witness, how is that going to be affected by you allowing Christ to live his life in you? It's going to transform. You're going to be, you're, you will be, if, if you're not already, and I believe many of you are already, so praise the Lord for that. But as you consecrate yourself daily to, to, to the Lord, he's going to use you in ways that you would never imagine to shine to people because there is something beautiful about a Christian witness that comes um, unselfishly, 
uh, without without preconceived notions, without um, agendas, just just share, just loving people and sharing this beautiful message of God's love and uh, sacrifice for each one of us. So, with that, I know this has been kind of a whirlwind of a of a um, uh, of a message tonight, but I really pray that for each of you, um, you contemplate the idea that. You know, Christ needs to be resurrected in each of our hearts and that we all need that newness of life that only comes through him and his power, his resurrection power in us. Um, so I pray that for each of each one of you. Um, and my my um, my appeal is that you will consecrate yourself every day. Um, you'll give yourself to him and um, you will recognize uh, that as you give yourself to him, he's going to use you in, in incredible, beautiful, and powerful ways. So with that, why don't we have a word of prayer and, um, and we'll, we'll close off. Father in heaven, Lord, we are blessed to know that not only did you die, uh, you took uh, our sin, our shame, you died on the cross for us through your son, Jesus Christ. You have taken upon yourself the pain that we deserved. But not only that, Lord, you have, um, as Christ was resurrected from the tomb, as he took the life that was rightfully his, um, uh, that he could lay down and he could take up, that we can also um, access that victory, the victory that he won as he came out of that tomb, Lord. We know that uh, no matter what the devil tries to do to hold you back, you have the power, uh, much greater power, um, to come into our lives, transform us, um, to turn us into your likeness, to make us more than conquerors. I just pray for each one in the listening of this uh, of this recording that you would just work in their hearts, that you would um, live out your life in them, and that you would continually um, shine through them so that many others uh, would see the beauty of, of complete surrender and, and giving of um, our allegiance to you and accepting your authority in our lives, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So God bless you all, and I look forward to you, to uh, talking to you in our, in our next uh, session.